So good afternoon. We have a 1201 and we're delighted to have everyone with us today, both virtually and in person. I just, before we get started with our guest speaker today, I would like to remind everyone that we will have Kathy Rawls, director of the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries and a native of Bertie County. So apparently the month of March, we're really highlighting the county of Bertie with our, even with our guest speaker today. But um, on March the 16th at 12 p.m., Kathy will discuss her achievements in being with the division for more than 25 years and as the first woman to head the agency since the Fisheries Commission Board became the Division of Commercial Fisheries in the late 1920s. Um, so she will be speaking with us on Wednesday, March the 16th at 12 p.m. So if you have a chance to join us, we'll offer that in person and virtually too. But today we are very um, delighted to have Dr. Smallwood here. He is a professor and chair of the Department of History and Political Science at North Carolina A&T. Dr. Smallwood, um, also I would like to note that on February the 24th, Dr. Smallwood was awarded uh, the um, ex, uh, award for excellent in public service. He was one of the top two as one of the top two annual awards bestowed by the University of North Carolina Board of Governors. The award to Dr. Small marks the first time a North Carolina A and T faculty member has been awarded um, has been selected for the honor. Um, it, which was the first one was presented in 2014. Dr. Smallwood is um, also chair of the A&T Department of History and Political Science and is a Carter G. Woodson Distinguished Lecturer, so named by the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Presentations by Dr. Smallwood to groups, big and small, all over the past decade reveals a scholar deeply knowledgeable in how Native American, African American, and Europeans lived and interacted with each other in what we now know, what we, what we know now as North Carolina. So with all that being said, I'm gonna turn over our program to Dr. Smallwood. We are just delighted to have him here. And I'm gonna share the screen before we get started. So Dr. Smallwood, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, you all can uh, give me a cue if I run over time and I'll try to make sure that I um, stay on time. Um, again, I'm very happy to be here. I was mentioning that I came in yesterday afternoon and had a chance to tour the museum and uh, you know this very impressive museum and um, uh, the connections between Berkeley County and Elizabeth City, of course, are pretty profound. Uh, my great aunt attended school here, and she was a school te uh, teacher in Berkeley County for you know for many years uh, before she retired. And my mother, although she didn't finish school, she did start at Elizabeth City State and uh, did you know one year here. So there are family members who have lived you know here and worked here in Elizabeth City and, and in this area. And so there's just a lot of ties between, uh, as you all know from the museum and anybody who's from this region knows uh, that there are ties between the various counties in this part of North Carolina that are historic. They go back for hundreds of years. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Native Americans. And um, you know the presentation again, is looking at Native Americans um, in early North Carolina. Um, and I'm gonna try to do a very brief history, but. Uh, you know, I, I can be a little long sometimes, so I'll try to make it uh, as, 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 you know, as brief as possible, but we, that we touch on all of the main points. So what I usually start with when I talk about uh, Native American history, and I do do Native American history, I do African American history, Native American history, modern European history, and that's kind of how I blended them in most of my research, because you can't really fully understand uh, one group without understanding the other and how these different groups interacted with one another. Um, and so I'm gonna start off by being broad, right? That if we talk about Native American history in North America, what becomes the United States, 
it's important to understand that it's divided into regions. And there are multiple regions, all together about 13 regions, but we're only going to focus on the regions in the east. And there are two major regions in the east. There's the northeastern woodland nations and there's the southeastern woodland nations. And although North Carolina is seen as being in the south, and we may think of North Carolina as being uh, southeastern Indians, most of the Indians of, of eastern North Carolina, all of the Indians of eastern North Carolina and north of the Cape Fear River were considered northeastern Indians. And they had more in common with the Northeast Indians, uh, particularly the uh, Mohawks and Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, Senecas, but also Delawares, um, you know, Susquehannas, and other Indians of the Northeastern part of the United States. Uh, the major Southeastern groups, we often talk about the Cherokees, uh, and I point out to people that Cherokees were really in Tennessee, and they were in the mountains of Tennessee, and maybe just on the edge of the mountains of North Carolina, but they were primarily in Tennessee. And they, along with the Creeks and the Catawbas and Yamases uh, and Chickasaws, Choctaws, are what we call Southeastern Indians. So we know there are over 500 nations of Indians. There are many nations of Indians in North Carolina. I have not begun to talk about them, but I will touch on them. Uh, but in terms of major groups of Indians, I'm just giving you a sampling, because I can't list them all here, just so that you have an understanding. And you can see the linguistic differences between the groups, because in the Northeast, you have both Iroquois Indians and Algonquin Indians. And then in the Southeast, you have Iroquois, Siouan, and Muskegon Indians. So we think of these different cultural groups or language groups. And I point out to people to help them understand what that's about. It's the same thing as Europe or Africa. If you look at Europe, you got French and they're French speaking people. So you have France, you know, that country. And then you have Germans in the German countries. You got Russians. And we talk about what's happening in Ukraine and with Russia today. So they're language groups. So these groups of Indians speak the same language or a language that is very similar so they can communicate with one another. But just like in Europe and in Africa and in Asia, the Native Americans know the languages of their neighbors and they can speak the languages of their neighbors and words can be translated. So they understand uh, the cultures of people that are near them that they trade with. They are sometimes in conflict with, they war with, but they certainly uh, definitely um, interact with and in many cases intermix with. So if we talk about those language groups, what we're looking at and what we're talking about is the dominant groups in North Carolina and in the Southeast are the Iroquois people and the Algonquin people along the coast. And the Algonquins basically come down out of Canada. So they, they like parallel each other. I often think about the Civil War and think about the Union Army parallel and the Confederate Army, particularly Lee's Army in the last days of the war. They're coming down together and they're side by side because he surrenders at Appomattox. Well, the Iroquois and the Algonquins are doing the same thing. They're paralleling each other, coming down from uh, the Great Lakes region or from Canada, from Montreal and the St. Lawrence River Valley area. They're paralleling each other as they come along the coast. So the Algonquins are on the coast and coming along into places like Delaware, uh, places like uh, coastal uh, New York and Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and the Iroquois are coming down through the mountains and coming down in the Piedmont, and they're basically following them down. Now, which groups actually get into the region first is kind of hard to say, but we know that for many years before Europeans arrived, before the Spanish come or the English come, the Algonquins are in coastal Virginia and the Iroquois Indians are in the coastal plains and Piedmont of, North, of Virginia and North Carolina, and that they are coexisting in that landscape uh, during that time. Uh, I also take a quick note that even though the Cherokees consider themselves uh, Muskegon people, uh, they really uh, were um, Iroquois people, and they basically become Muskegon because they absorb so many Creek women, Creek serfs, Muskegon, that they alter the culture of the Cherokees, and they begin to see themselves as being more uh, Muskegon than they do um, Iroquois. Okay. So when we talk about North Carolina Indians, and we talk about the Indians of the Albemarle region, what we're looking at are two major groups that are coalescing in Northeastern North Carolina or the Albemarle region. We're looking at the Iroquois Indians, which are settled in the coastal plains and at the mouths of all of the major rivers and they hunt and they gather um, in the various areas along the coastal parts of North Carolina, including the Outer Banks. And they hunt up into the Piedmont as far west as Guilford County and Forsyth County, as far west as Greensboro and Winston-Salem. 
but these are the two groups of people that are in existence in North America. And I just explained how the Algonquins got there. They come down out of Canada and they settle all along the Atlantic coast. And eventually they end in North Carolina and the Iroquois kind of wrap them you know, from the Southern part of their area uh, northward because the core Indians, the Noose Indians, they are Iroquois Indians, very much like the Meharans and the Nottaways. And then you have these overlapping cultures like the Pamlico Indians and some of the other, the Bay River Indians, which we'll talk about a little bit later on that over, overlap in that uh, general area. Okay. So the, one of the first significant adjustments, and we've talked about the Algonquin peoples coming in and the Algonquin peoples being here. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about is the changes in Eastern North Carolina as pertains to these Algonquins. But uh, I think it's important to understand the arrival of the Haudenosaunee who are the Iroquois Indians into Virginia and North Carolina and the impact that they have on Algonquin Indians, uh, not just in North Carolina, but in Virginia and North Carolina and pretty much all along the coast. Because if you know the history of the Iroquois and the history of the Algonquin speaking peoples along the coast, which include the Delaware Indians, um, you will understand that many of these Indians, particularly ones in New England and what became New England, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, those Indians were heavily influenced by the Mohawks and they created what we call the Eastern Indian Confederation with the guidance of the Mohawks. And then as you come along the coast, the Delaware Indians, for example, are confederated with the Iroquois and they have uh, been confederated for a very, very long time. And then on down uh, the coast, when we get to the Powhatan Confederation and there's some question about the Powhatan Confederation and its relationship with the Iroquois Confederation. So all of these Indians had some interaction and they knew each other but when we talk about Virginia and North Carolina and we talk about the Albemarle region, I think it's important for us to talk about the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois and their arrival in North Carolina and the impact that that group has in terms of its interaction with Algonquins in the region and the impact that Europeans have on these groups of Indians creating and realigning uh, military and political alliances in the Albemarle region during the early colonial period. So I always talk with people and explain to them about who the Haudenosaunee are and the groups of Indians that are in North Carolina that are connected to them or who are also Haudenosaunee. And they are the Tuscaroras, the Nottaways, and the Meharans. And uh, the Nottaways are in southeastern Virginia, uh, near Portland, Virginia, but basically in southeast Virginia. And of course, during traditional times, there was no boundary between Virginia and North Carolina. So you move right out of the Nottaway territories into the Meharan territories. And if you know the Meharans, they're in the Witten Triangle and in Ahoskey and Hertford, Northampton, Halifax counties, uh, but in the North, in that Northeast corridor going down into Bertie County. And then you have the Tuscaroras proper in Bertie County and on down through the Southeastern counties, uh, everything from pretty much Pitt County to Cra uh, Craven County to, you know, all the way through down to Columbus County, but Tuscaroras are all throughout Eastern North Carolina. But as a quick history on the Haudenosaunee, it's important that they all originated in the ancient city of Cahokia, which was a city that existed, rose and fell a thousand years before Europeans arrived, it was one of the largest cities in the world. Uh, it was a mound city and the mounds were designed like the pyramids uh, of uh, the Aztec empire in Mexico. In fact, that is where we believe the people originated. They came up from Mexico into North America and then settled along the Mississippi River in uh, Cahokia. Cahokia is basically outside of the city of St. Louis, a little bit, maybe a mile or so outside of East St. Louis. The mounds are still there, massive earthen mounds that are designed just like Aztec temples. And it was the largest, one of the largest cities in the world. And that's where the, the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois people originated. And uh, there was a great natural disaster, uh, according to the tradition of flood that destroyed crops and destroyed people's homes. And we see how weather can impact people today. We talk about Hurricane Katrina and how the people were, were dispersed from New Orleans and they still haven't been able to return. Many of them have never returned and will never return after that great uh, disaster, after that hurricane. Um, they, the people were dispersed and spread east into uh, Ohio and into New York State. And then from New York State, they uh, began to split into what we call the five nations, the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, and the Tuscaroras. And then they had conflict with one another, and then they created what became known as the Great Law. 
and the peacemaker, you know, came to them and basically shared with them the great law and they ceased to fight amongst themselves and they created a great and powerful confederation which would become the largest and most uh, important confederation, native confederation in the history of the Western hemisphere. And we'll talk a little bit about that as I talk about some of the high civilizations. But again, the Cherokees originally were a part of this, but the Cherokees split off shortly after they left Cahokia during this disaster. And then since they merged with the Creek Indians in Tennessee and North Georgia, they just began to lose all contact with the Tuscaroras and actually became enemies of the Six Nations, Five Nations, plus the Tuscaroras and the Meharan and Nautilus. If you wanna look at it in a graph and talk about genetically how this all plays out, they start as one people. Cherokee split off first, the CH there is Cherokee. The Tuscarora split off next, and we have the Meharans and the Nataways split off from the Tuscarora. So the bottom line is that Meharans and the Tuscarora and the Nataways are all the same people. They're the same. They're all Tuscaroras. They just split, and when the Europeans come, they get different names. The Virginians call the Nataways Nataway, and they call the Meharans Meharans, and the Tuscaroras are called Tuscarora proper. You go further down the bloodline and you will see that the Cayuga nation splits off next and then kind of intersects with the other nations, you know, to find its place. The Hurons and the Wydots were in the Great Lakes regions, they split off. Then we have uh, the Seneca Indians uh, split off. We have, again, the Cayugas come into play. We have the uh, Onondagas, the Susquehannas, the Oneidas, O-E is for Oneidas, and then we have the Mohawk. And so they all, again, I said, are kin. They all come off of the same bloodline. And it's like you have multiple brothers and sisters. You may have three, four brothers and sisters. Or back in the old times, people have as many as 10, 12, 15 brothers and sisters. And they all just come from the same mother and father, but they split off and then they settle in different places and they can create their own families and have their own lives. Same concept. So when I talk about the Iroquois and these nations connected to the Iroquois, but specifically the five nations and with the Tuscarora being affiliated to six nation, they are they make up what we call the Iroquois Confederation or like I said, the Haudenosaunee people. And when we think of high civilizations, highly advanced, advanced native civilizations, we think of the Iroquois along with the Mayans, along with the Aztecs, along with the Incas, along with the Pueblos, along with the North Pacific Coast Indians, we think of the Iroquois as being a highly advanced civilization, a highly advanced group of Indians. This does not mean that other Indian nations were not as advanced. It does not mean that other Indian nations were not as significant because they all were very significant. And as I mentioned, in North America alone, there were over 500 different nations of Indians, but we're speaking specifically to this particular group of Indians. And we said, well, why is the Great Law so important? And why is the Iroquois Confederation so significant? One of the reasons is because the great law and the Iroquois people, they were a democracy. They were one of the world's first democracies. And they are the foundation, the great law is the foundation for the US constitution. Remember when the Europeans came to uh, Virginia and came to the Americas, they didn't have any concept of democracy. They were coming out of absolute monarchies. The kings ruled, the kings were divine. The king spoke to the Pope or to the church, head of the church. And in England's case, the king was the head of the church. And the head of the church speaks directly to God. But the kings were divine and they were infallible. And uh, what they said went. And if you went against the king, the king cut off your head. That was just how it went. There was no such thing as a democracy. You had the nobles and the nobles could hold counsel with the king and so forth. But there was a complete distinction between nobility and the nobles and the masses. In other words, you could be English. But if you are not part of the aristocracy, part of the nobility, they didn't care about the peasants in England. They were peasants. They were the same as slaves. They did not intermix with them. They didn't intermarry with them. And they had no respect for them in terms of equality or what they had to say when it came to government. So what existed in North America amongst the Iroquois was unique. And what will happen is that the English and other European nations will see what the Indians are doing and how they unite themselves. And famously, Benjamin Franklin points out uh, that we need to do what these Indians are doing and we need to align ourselves because in the early years, the colonies were disjointed. You know, South Carolina didn't care about North Carolina. Uh, you know, New York didn't care about Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania didn't care about Virginia. Everybody was doing their own thing and all they cared about was their own colony. But the Indians were united, the Iroquois were united. And anyone who came under the Iroquois, the Delawares 
uh, or any of the other nations that came under them, the Tutelos, the Ponies, uh, Susquehannas, they created what they call a covenant chain. And the chain, as they would say, would be unbreakable. Once you were a part of the Confederation, you were a part of the Confederation and you went under their protection. So it was a very massive and interesting endeavor that connects directly to uh, North Carolina, I'm sorry, directly to North Carolina uh, through the five nations, which become known as the six nations uh, in terms of the Tuscaroras and the Meharan and Ottawa's involvement with the Iroquois Confederation, they become known as the six nations. Okay. Now from Tuscarora's history, oral tradition, they were always the Six Nation. They were always part of the Iroquois Confederacy. But from uh, our understanding, when Europeans began to record records, they don't officially join the Five Nations until after the Tuscarora War, roughly officially in 1722, but unofficially they were already there as early as 1713 and 1715. And we know they had affiliations as early as 1709, because the Tuscarora sent a delegation to Pennsylvania to the governor of uh, Pennsylvania in Philadelphia to petition that the Tuscarora leave North Carolina and move to Pennsylvania because of conflicts with whites in North Carolina, with them kidnapping their women and children and selling them into slavery. So it's important to understand that this is the political ideology, the philosophy that the Tuscaroras had and shared with the people in this region, in the Albemarle region, and it becomes foundational in terms of understanding government and understanding the way in which the region develops uh, after uh, this particular period. This is a French image of the Iroquois Confederacy. You, if you know geography and, and can read maps, you can clearly see Massachusetts, you know, the curl out in the ocean. You can clearly see Long Island in the pink, uh, New York and the Hudson River Valley. You can clearly see New Jersey and also Maryland in the Eastern shore, the Chesapeake Bay. And then you can clearly see down to North Carolina. And you can see in the back country, the Iroquois longhouses and their villages with the Palisades around them. You can clearly see uh, this empire that we're talking about and the influence that it has uh, during these maps are from the 16, early 1600s, but you can clearly see um, these groups and their impact. So they migrate into North Carolina, the Tuscaroras, and we talked about the Algonquins coming down along the coast from Canada. But it's the Iroquois, the Tuscaroras migrate into Eastern North Carolina, the Maharans, the Nottaways, and the Tuscaroras along the river systems. The rivers still bear their names today. I mean, you have the Roanoke River, which again, Roanoke Indians were further east, and of course they you know, ceased to exist and it, it absorbed or were really Iroquois in a sense, Iroquois slash Algonquin, and we'll talk about that. But the Maharan River and uh, the uh, Choan River, uh, the Roanoke River, the Nottaway River, the Nottaway Indians are in Virginia on the Nottaway uh, River. The Meharans start in Virginia and come into Eastern North Carolina to Hertford County on the Meharan River. The Tuscaroras are along the Roanoke River and they all come down right out of the source of the Roanoke is in uh, Virginia and what is now Roanoke, Virginia, which used to, be called, used to be called Big Lick and comes right on down into Eastern North Carolina. As they come in and as they settle along those major rivers in Eastern North Carolina, uh, again, the Algonquins are coming along and moving into the east, into Pasquotank, uh, Perquimans counties, uh, Camden, Coratuck, Chowan counties, and the Iroquois are moving into uh, what would be Hertford County, Gates County, um, Bertie County, Northampton County, Halifax County, but on down into that region in southern, the counties in southeast Virginia. They continue to move south, the Tuscaroras do, and the Algonquins, they have to cross the Albemarle Sound, but they settle along the various island uh, river systems, uh, including the Alligator River in northeastern North Carolina, um, and across over from the Albemarle region into places like Hyde County and also Beaufort County, uh, Terrell County. But they cross over into uh, that part of northeast North Carolina that's on the south side of the Albemarle Sound. And the Iroquois are in the interior, and they're settling along the Tar River, the Noose River, and they will eventually go down as far south as the Cape Fear River in eastern North Carolina. So they're moving down the river system out of the mountains, out of the Appalachians. They then move southward along the rivers and settle along the river systems using the various road systems that we still have in existence today. And I'll come back to that too shortly uh, because it's important for people to know that Highway 17, 64, 264, 58, 258, 
158, all of these roads, these North Carolina routes, these Virginia routes, US routes, they were Indian trading paths and the Indians used them prior to the Europeans arriving. And what the Europeans do is they come and they clear the land. This is all dense forest here in and around Elizabeth City. It's hard to imagine, but this was all dense forest that would, timber was cut out by the English to basically build their ships and use the tar and pitch and resin to patch their ships to build the British Navy in the colonial period. But this was all dense forest before the forests were cut out and they were turned into farms. And all of these roads that we see running crisscrossing and running through these areas were all Indian trading paths that the Indians used to move from one part of the uh, region to the other, okay? So this map shows the Iroquois around the Great Lakes region, which would include, as I already said, the Mohawks and Oneidas, Cayugas, Hurons, et cetera. Uh, it shows the Tuscaroras in Eastern North Carolina, bordering against the Algonquins who are in the coastal area. And then we have the Cherokees uh, in the West in Tennessee and North Georgia, but in the Western part of, um, of the Southeast. As I mentioned before, because of these relationships and the Tuscaroras saying they were always affiliated with the Five Nations, you have this massive empire with the Tuscarora being in Eastern North Carolina and the Algonquin speaking peoples either in at some point in conflict with the Tuscaroras because they're the more powerful group in the region, but then eventually in alliance and remain in alliance. And those alliances are started as early as the middle and early uh, 1500s because of the Spanish. And we're gonna to touch on that in just a moment as well to talk about how these shifting alliances in the East between the Algonquin speaking peoples and the Iroquois people, how they come about and how they exist. But the Tuscaroras you know, are well settled in the region. The Tuscaroras will develop and have uh, seven clans before the, uh, Columbus, before 1492. And I'm speaking to them because I do most of my research on Tuscaroras, but you can apply this concept to the Algonquin speaking peoples as well. Uh, the Chilinokes and the other groups of Algonquin speaking Indians that were in Eastern North Carolina as well. The clans tend to be named for animals that were in abundance in their region. For example, in Indian woods where I'm from, I lived, I grew up in Indian woods. My family has deep roots there. Um, we have a creek called Rockquest Creek. Rockquest in Tuscarora means turtle, turtle creek. And you can still see the alligator turtles, the snapping turtles in the creek. And we eat turtle, we still eat turtle today. And many native people eat turtle and the clans are named for the turtles. Uh, chief Leo Henry, who just died, who was chief of the Tuscaroras in New York, he was part of the turtle clan. And so it's important to understand that, you know, people eat bear. I mean, I was down in a group in Pamlico County and they were like surprised. I was like, y'all don't eat bear, you don't eat deer, you don't eat uh, turtle, all these things we still eat, eel, you never ate eel. All these things we still eat in Bertie County and still eat specifically in Indian woods. We still prepare it, we still cook it, we still eat it. And it's just a continuation of that mis mixing and merging of history and culture between native peoples and uh, African-American as well as European people. But those seven clans, and all of them of course are related by blood, but then within a clan, you cannot marry anyone in your clan, you have to marry someone from another clan. So there could be, let's say if there are 10,000 people in the bear clan, uh, a bear can't marry a bear. A bear can marry a deer or marry an eel, but they can't marry a bear. So they remain thoroughly mixed with one another, kinship-wise. They're thoroughly in involved with one another because of these clan structures and everybody within a clan is related by blood. They're all kin and they all look out for each other. If you attack one Tuscarora, you attack them all. If you attack one Iroquois, one Mohawk, you attack them all. And they all will sweep down on you with full force. All of the five nations, all of the six nations and their allies will sweep down on you in force and completely obliterate you. They were feared and known for their prowess. Everybody's heard of Mohawk and you kind of understand what Mohawk means. Uh, and they, but people don't seem to understand the relationship that the Mohawks and the others had with the Indians in North Carolina, particularly the Tuscaroras, but also the Algonquin speaking people in North Carolina. Okay. Because of the Tuscaroras, position in Eastern North Carolina, because of their military might with the Nottaways and the Maharans and reinforced by the five nations in New York state and their alliances with neighboring Siouan and Iroquois, uh, Algonquin peoples. They are one of the most powerful Indian nations in North Carolina and they pretty much dominate North Carolina from the coast and from the outer banks of North Carolina up to the mountains. And again, I think that is something that's also not often thought about and realized, okay? It's important to understand that 
one of the reasons why they're so significant is because of their access to the Outer Banks of North Carolina and the fact that they would go to the Outer Banks of North Carolina and gather seashells. It's important to understand that Native Americans valued seashells in pretty much the same way that Europeans value gold and silver. And it's not any old seashell. You can go to the Outer Banks and you've got all kinds of oyster shells and clam shells and all kinds of seashells. They're not interested in any kind of seashell. They're interested in a particular seashell, which is a purplish seashell. And they use that seashell to create um, wampum, wampum belts. And the seashell itself is used as currency. And the Native Americans value the seashell in pretty much the same way that Europeans value silver and gold. And, and precious stones, you know, diamonds, rubies, um, you know, so forth, but precious stones. So it's important to understand that, um, and I want to point out one other point about these wampum belts, is that um, the shells that are gathered on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, that they use to make these wampum belts, and then of course trade the shells as currency, bags of shells can be traded as currency as well. Uh, wampum belts, actually, um, people say when well, Native Americans don't have a written language, everything is oral. And although they do have oral traditions, and although their oral traditions have been recorded by people like Benjamin Franklin as being as accurate, if not more accurate, than the English written record. Uh, if you look at Benjamin Franklin's Indian treaties, he talks about uh, treaties between um, the Iroquois and the, uh, the governors of Virginia and Maryland. And the governors of Virginia and Maryland uh, were trying to say that the Iroquois who controlled all the back country of Virginia, the Seneca invasion occurred in 1675 and all of the Piedmont of Virginia and all of the Shenandoah Valley, all of Western Virginia belonged to the Six Nations, to the Iroquois. They linked up with the Tuscaroras in North Carolina. But Virginia tried to say, well, no, that land doesn't belong to them. And the Tuscarora, uh, the Iroquois chief, the chief of the Six Nations spoke in council uh, at the uh, meeting to decide about this land, because they were going to go to war with Virginia and Maryland over the land if it was not settled. And uh, they pretended there was no treaty. And uh, the what we see happening is that the governor of Pennsylvania, who was a Quaker, and the Quakers tended to be more fair-minded with the Indians than the other English settlers, um, he had the treaty, but he didn't pull it out. He let the Virginians talk about the fact that the Indians had no claim here, that this didn't belong to them, the uh, Iroquois leader got up and spoke eloquently, and he spoke to the letter of what was in the treaty. That's how clear their minds were, spoke to the letter of what was in the treaty, and acknowledged that the Tuscaroras had been defeated in war in North Carolina and pushed out of North Carolina into Virginia, but that they had never ceded uh, their lands in Virginia and in the Shenandoah Valley, that they had won that land with blood, because at one time the Cherokees were in that part of uh, Virginia, and they had pushed the Cherokees all the way back down into Chattanooga, Tennessee. When they pulled out the treaty, everything he had said was proven to be true. And the governor of Pennsylvania and New York made the governor of Virginia pay the Iroquois for that land. And then they retreated out of the Piedmont into the Shenandoah Valley and retreated into the Alleghenies and allowed the Virginians to settle that country. So it's important to understand that one of the ways they captured this was not just orally, but when he spoke, he had what was called a wampum belt. And that those wampum belts could be as, as long as five and six feet long. They're made out of these seashells and they have images on them. I equate them to Egyptian hieroglyphics. They show pictures of individuals. They show zigzag lines. They show information on them. And the clan mothers and the chiefs can read the wampum belts. They'll pull out a wampum belt, let it drop to the floor, and they can tell you from beginning to end in chronological order everything that every one of those seashells represented, and they do have a recorded history. And they still have hundreds of these belts with them even today at uh, Grand River in um, Oswego, New York, and also the Tuscaroras in Lewiston, New York at Tuscarora. They still have these belts, and at Howell's Cave, the Iroquois Museum, they still have these wampum belts that record their history and tell their stories. But that is one of the reasons why the Tuscarora was so important to the Confederation was because of the fact that they were able to gather these seashells from the outer banks of North Carolina and take them to the Iroquois to be used to make these wampum belts and to basically have this currency that was used with other Native Americans um, in their empire. So now getting to North Carolina. 
And I do want to acknowledge that this map, although it's one of the best that we have right now, it is slightly off. It's not exactly, the boundaries aren't exactly how they're supposed to be, but it gives you an understanding of the Indians that were in North Carolina and their language group, their nations, right? So you have, like I said, again, starting in Virginia because they're all Algonquin speaking peoples. And in fact, we know the Powhatans, but the Powhatans were a confederation. And there were many different nation of Indians that were part of that confederation, including the Chesapeake Indians, the Nazman Indians, and even to a lesser extent, the Choanoke Indians. It's also important to understand that the Indians who were border Indians, like the Choanoke, you have the Choanoke Indians, but the border Indians, just like any other border nation, right? If you are a border nation, just like we see what's happening in Ukraine and the Russians right now, right? You got a powerful uh, nation to your, you know, to your west or to your east, and then you got other powerful nations to the west or to the east, the other side. You're in the middle. And because you're in the middle, you need to learn both cultures, learn both languages, and have alliances, political and military alliances, with both groups of people. So the Choanokes find themselves on the border between the Tuscaroras and uh, the Maharans and the Nataways and their kinsmen, the Algonquin, that are to the east. And they share this border. And when we talk about traveling to the Outer Banks from the perspective of Tuscaroras orally, they said they controlled everything from the ocean to the mountains. And they traveled to the Outer Banks of North Carolina to gather their seashells unmolested because no Indians would stand against them. Even when you get to John White's time, when John White came in and made contact with the coastal Indians who were Algonquins, the first thing they asked them for was could they create an alliance with them against the warlike Indians to the West. And the Indians they were talking about, they call them Mar uh, monogoks and the monogoks of the Tuscaroras. So the point is they were ready to realign themselves and they would have realigned themselves with the English, but the English ruined any opportunity for it uh, by taking their food, killing their chiefs, cutting off the heads of their chiefs. And so they only fall further in alliance with the Tuscaroras. You know, you take the lesser of the evils and they saw an opportunity, but that opportunity didn't pan out because the English they found to be more brutal and more savage than their enemies, the Tuscaroras, and so they fall into better alliance with the Tuscaroras instead of staying with the English. But you get a clear understanding of the coastal areas, and you see that the Algonquin-speaking people in the coastal areas are encircled by Iroquois because the Noose Indians and the Core Indians are also Iroquois, you know, like the Maharans and the Nataways in Virginia. So you have these Indians, and I'm gonna talk about how they get into coastal North Carolina and migrate into that region as well, but you see you know, the way in which these peoples are set up and they are uh, connected and they're in alliance with one another, okay? I just put this illustration in just to point out again, if you look on the coastal areas, the Adonquins on the coast, and you look at the Powhatans, and then the Powhatans were just one group of many groups. They call it the Powhatan Confederation because they were the largest of the groups and the most powerful of the groups, but there were other groups that were part of that confederation and they constituted the confederation. And when the Virginians came, when the Virginians, because they failed in North Carolina because of the damage they did with, uh, with Algonquin speaking people in North Carolina, then they go to the Chesapeake and they attempt to settle in the Chesapeake. And when they first make contact with the Indians in the Chesapeake, one of the things that is said is that they have to go and speak to the great chief who lives to the West about whether or not they can interact and work with these people and create any alliances. You know, you can be, you know, in an alliance and you might not think it's the best because you're kind of subject and they were subject to the Iroquois people, but at the same time, you don't want to be completely annihilated, which is what they found themselves in a situation with, with the English, with their superior weaponry and technology. And this is what you're going to see as the English push into Virginia and push into North Carolina. Um, they're going to displace Algonquin speaking peoples and those people are going to have to ask the Iroquois, the Tuscaroras and their allies if they can travel through their territory and if they can settle in their territory. And we'll talk about groups like the Saponis and whatnot. They're coming out of Virginia and fleeing the whites in Virginia and their advances southward and westward. And they go west of the Tuscarora territories to be safe. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. But there is a world before Europeans and then there's a world after Europeans. And again, this world before the Europeans the Algonquin speaking peoples in the Albemarle region and throughout Eastern North Carolina and Southeastern Virginia are pretty much acting as one and they're interacting with each other, they're trading and then they're trading with their Iroquois neighbors and many of them can speak the languages of each other's nation 
And it's always been reported that the Tuscaroras, most nations knew how to speak Tuscarora because they were the dominant trading nation, the dominant nation, just like everybody in the world speaks English, right? Because that is a dominant language, you know, but, uh, but not all the other, uh, but the Iroquois didn't necessarily speak all of the languages of the other folks. But one of the best ways to have alliances is through marriage. And we do see Tuscaroras or Iroquois people intermarrying with Algonquin speaking people uh, throughout Virginia and throughout um, Eastern North Carolina. So this is a map from just before the Tuscarora War in 1711. And on the map, you can see all the Indian villages stretching down from the Chowan River and the Roanoke River, Tar River, the Noose River, uh, Chetnia Creek, and on down towards the Cape Fear River. And you'll see the major towns of the major combatants, uh, Chief Blunt's town, you'll see, uh, which was along the Tar River near Tarboro, his people would eventually move to Indian Woods and settled in Indian Woods, but his original town was actually on the Tar River near Tarboro. And then Chief Hancock's town, which is on Chetnia Creek, which is further south near Snow Hill and down in that region, and you go on further down. But pretty much things would have been this way. Uh, they were definitely this way at the start of the war. This is a very detailed map of Eastern North Carolina showing the locations of different Indian nations uh, in Eastern North Carolina but with the exception of the loss of people to disease, which we're gonna talk about, it's hard to get a clear idea of how many tens of thousands of Tuscarora and, Iroqu uh, and Algonquin peoples there were in Eastern North Carolina because of disease. And I'm gonna hit you there. There are three major disease outbreaks that I wanna talk about. One introduced by the Spanish as early as 1565 or 1560s and 70s, and then the English in the 1580s, and then uh, we see before the Tuscarora War, reports of yellow fever, reports of smallpox breaking out and devastating Native American communities. So when you had people coming in sometimes to areas that had been settled and had hundreds or thousands of Indians, they're abandoned. They see land already cleared, they see abandoned houses, there's nobody there because the disease has already wiped them all out. And this is a time to talk about the impact of disease because we all have seen the impact of disease on our country and on the world today. And if it wasn't for our mask and our science and our um, ability uh, to, to stay uh, and do Zooms, like many of the people who are watching this are not here because we have that ability, but native people lived in longhouses. You have multiple generations, particularly in North Carolina and Virginia who lived in longhouses. So you would have great grandparents, grandparents, parents, uh, and children all living in the same dwelling. It was called a longhouse because they would add to the house that extended as the family grew. And in that way, everybody's living under the same roof. So when you have a disease like this disease that we're dealing with now or smallpox or influenza or mumps or measles or rubella, it wipes out all of the elderly within the longhouse. It wipes out all the youngest children within the longhouse. Only the very strongest can survive. And that's gonna to tend to be people between the ages of 13 and let's say about 30. So they have a devastating impact. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment as well. But just giving you an idea of Eastern North Carolina and how it's connected. And then I pointed out to you at the very start as we were kind of talking through these road systems and I've just put them up here for you now. We take these highways for granted, you know, um, like I said, uh, 158, 58, 258, 64, 264, 17, US 1. We take these roads for granted, not the interstates. The interstates were built during the Truman years and they were modeling after what the Germans had, the uh, Audubon in Germany, but all of our US routes, all of our state routes, those were early Indian trading paths. They became colonial roads, and then they become our state highway system um, today, okay? But that is how people in the Algonquins in the coastal areas of Eastern North Carolina, the Iroquois people in the coastal plains, and in the Piedmont, that's how all these people are interacting. That's how they're trading, how they're getting around. They're using these established roads that have been in existence for over a thousand years. So I'm gonna to touch on um, the Spanish invasion and try to be very brief because I'm gonna save some time for questions if there are questions. It's important to understand that the Spanish are the first to kind of interact with people in coastal North Carolina. If you know early history, you know the Spanish came first in 1492, from 1492 through the 1500s, almost 100 years uh, before, uh, you know, the English or the French or anybody else really has a chance to get into the Americas. The Spanish are here and they are devastating the Americas. 
They are enslaving women and children, taking them back, taking women back to Europe as sex slaves. They're just decimating uh, the peoples in the Caribbean and in Mexico and in Central America. And they're converting them to Catholicism. They're radically changing their whole way of life. And they're going through and they're pretty much uh, having a tremendous impact on all of this hemisphere. And you have to ask yourself the question, if they have that greater impact on uh, Mexico, Florida, Texas, California, uh, the Caribbean, South America, Central America. Well, why don't they have that impact on North America? Why didn't they have that impact in Virginia and the North Carolina? And the answer to the question is they attempted to, because they mapped the region. It's not like there's nothing that's not known. What we have a tendency to do is that we only care about the English. So we only read what the English have to say, what the English generals say, what the English uh, king says, you know, what the Lord proprietors say. We don't care about what the Spanish have done, you know, and did a hundred years before the English ever came. We don't care about what the French have done, but when you pull the French material, the English material and the Spanish material together, you understand it was very little about North America that the Europeans did not know. They protected and guarded their information and they did not share it with their enemies, but the Europeans were just like native people. The English despised the uh, Spanish and they did despise the English. And they also disliked the French and they disliked the Dutch and they disliked each other. So they weren't trying to share their information. But the Spanish made an effort to invade North Carolina and Virginia, and they failed. They explored the coast of North Carolina. They captured women and children and men, sold them into slavery, took them back to, to, to Europe or shipped them to the Caribbean. And they even went into the Chesapeake in what we call Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, right? For the English in 1570, they go to Jamestown and they establish a mission, a Catholic church, and they attempt to Christianize the Powhatan, the, uh, the Indians in that region. The Powhatans aren't very keen on being Christianized or colonized, and so they rise up against the Spanish. They burn the church, they kill the priests, and they eradicate these people from their community. Now, the worst thing you can do in Spanish society is to kill a religious person, to kill a priest. And so the Spanish will come back and they will raid the area and they will kill everybody they see. They kill women, men, children, burn villages. They decimate that region and also into the interior of North Carolina in revenge for the destruction of that church. And all it does is it causes the Algonquin speaking people to realign themselves with the Iroquois people because the enemy is not the Iroquois anymore. The enemy is the Spanish, it's the whites. And they realign themselves, and through those realignments, they're able to protect themselves, uh, but the damage is done. Not only do they come through and decimate whole villages and whole communities of people and cause them to have to migrate, we see what's happening in Ukraine today. The, the, the reaction to when people are in force attacking you, killing your people, burning your homes, is to flee, right? So many of the Algonquins flee, and they flee south into North Carolina and into coastal North Carolina to get away from the attacks of the Spanish. And if we wanna talk about what do these attacks look like, then here are examples of what these attacks look like. Bartholomew was a Catholic priest who accompanied the conquistadors on their campaigns in Indian territories uh, in the Americas. You can clearly see, if you've been looking at John White's drawings and you saw the Iroquois villages earlier, you can clearly see these in longhouses, right? Now, the um, Algonquin-speaking people and the Iroquois people had similar structures, but their structures were very different than the Creeks and the Cherokees and the Yamasees and, and the Catawbas. They had very different housing, very different structures. But the coastal uh, Algonquins, who tended to be closely aligned with the Iroquois, they had the same kind of longhouses as the Iroquois had. And you can see in these drawings that were done in the 1500s by Bartholomew, you can see the impact that the Spaniards are having on these native people. They are burning their villages, they're attacking their people, they're killing their chiefs, they're taking their goods and stores of food. They are decimating Indian peoples in the region. And I will tell you, native people believe in an eye for an eye and they believe in a blood feud. And if you believe that after you see and witness what the Spanish did to their people during these campaigns, in Virginia and in the Carolinas that they had any love for the Spanish and by default, uh, any love for whites, then you need to understand that that's just not the case. 
So it's important to understand that not only do these Europeans have a negative impact spreading disease and decimating Indian communities and Indian villages, but they have a long lasting memory. They don't forget. They have a long memory of what these people have done and are doing to them, and they do not soon forget. This illustration is of Spaniards chopping the hands and feet off of Indians as they are attempting to terrorize the Indians and subdue them. And I was at the American Philosophical Society. I was a fellow at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, and I was reading, uh, listening to uh, tape recorded interviews and reading transcripts of Tuscaroras, you know, from 1918 and from the early 1930s. And one of the stories that they passed down from generation to generation to generation was a story about the handless maiden, this beautiful Indian girl who had no hands. And when I read the story, I just said, well, like the other stories, this is just, you know, this is just a story, maybe to, you know, to scare the young children and make sure they behave properly until I saw these illustrations by Bartholomew and realized that the Spanish actually did chop the hands and the feet off of India to intimidate them and instill fear and terror in them. But what they do is they actually cause realignment, political realignment amongst the Indians in Virginia and in North Carolina. And so by the time the English arrive, there is a little bit of a difference in terms of how these alignments have occurred, okay? And again, we're talking 1560s, 1570s, when the Spanish come and the English come in the 1580s, that's not too far along. It's still kind of fresh in people's memory, but it's important to understand that this is one of the things that happens uh, during this particular time period. Mm -hmm. Want to touch on the English, but I'm going to pause at any minute and you give me a signal uh, when I'm out of time, because I'm close to being out of time <laughs> and I don't want to run over, but go ahead. Yeah, going the last okay, all right, because I, 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 it's a lot to cover in a short amount of time, but this is uh, information that is not often talked about in our school systems or even at our universities. And this is from 30 years of research that I've been doing on this um, after I left Bertie County and left this region. So I hope I've illustrated and laid out for you all, you know, what the world was like before Europeans, what the first Europeans, the Spanish, the impact that they had and what it meant. Now we're gonna come to English, right? That is most of our history, it's English history. And we know about the failed attempts by the English to settle North Carolina in the 1580s. And so I'm gonna to touch on that a little and talk about the impact that that has. Because what I want you to understand is that not only through warfare is the population reduced, but also through disease, the populations of native people in Southeast Virginia, Northeast North Carolina, the Albemarle region, they are reduced. They're constantly being reduced by these outbreaks of disease that are being spread and brought to the region by Europeans and also just these violent clashes that they're having with the Europeans as they attempt to colonize and try to settle uh, the region, okay? So we all know John White's famous drawings, um, great maps, detailed maps, just like the map I just showed you by the French. Uh, this map was drawn in 1584, uh, 85 by John White, Ralph Lane, detailed map of Eastern North Carolina. You see the Outer Banks, you see Roanoke Island, you see the Albemarle Sound, uh, the Chowan River and the Roanoke River. You see the various native villages and the native nations that are there. They are documented on the map. So you have a, a, a pretty clear understanding of when the English arrived, what was there. And these are just four of the major groups, but at least four major groups were identified in the Albemarle region when they first came in and mapped the region. And the one of the, the groups was, of course, the Chowanoks. The other group was the Wipok. Uh, the Sakton, and then the Monagoks. Now the Monagoks on this map are gonna be way to the west. You see the cluster of trees just kind of west and south of the Roanoke River. And if you look down on the screen sideways, you'll see Monagoks, right? Now the Monagoks are small, not because the nation was small, it's small because they didn't know anything about them. And the Algonquins wouldn't give them a whole lot of information about them. And so they wanted to know more about who these people were, but the Monagots, Monagots were Tuscaroras. That's who they were. And you'll see it in later treaties, you know, Monagot being equated to Tuscarora, but that's who they are, they're the Tuscaroras. And, uh, and the Tuscaroras were very secretive people and they didn't want, you know, people in their territory. 
But you see the villages again, we've seen this before, right? We saw this with the uh, French up in the Northeast, with the New England, we've seen this again with the Spanish, and we see the same structures, these uh, communities with long houses that the English are mapping along the coast. We see uh, their villages, and we see the crops that they're producing, corn, beans, and squash, what's called the Three Sisters, uh, tobacco. And of course, we know Virginia and North Carolina would take native tobacco and make an industry out of it and you know, create multimillionaires. People steal tobacco money uh, from you know, uh, the Dukes to uh, RJR Reynolds, you know, University of Richmond, a lot of tobacco money. So we still see uh, that, but you can see if you look in the center of the screen to the top, just above the villages, you see the, the, the fields of tobacco, and then you see the corn and you see the squash, you know, uh, everything from you know, uh, different types of squash, but you see a very organized community, a very organized society that the native people have and that the Europeans are mapping. We see the richness and the abundance of the landscape in terms of fishing. If you're from the region like I am, you know about herring fishing, and herring, uh, not to mention all the other uh, types of oyster and crab, you know, and, and uh, clams, all of this, you know, this, this is a very fertile area. And it hurts my heart today to see the region. I grew up in the region. And I grew up fishing in the Roanoke. I grew up catching perch and, uh, and catching heron. We would go night fishing with the nets. My uncle and my dad would bring uh, heron in out of the river, use moonlight to, to catch them at night because they reflect their silver and they reflect the moon. You, you know where the schools are. And they would pull them in and put them in the pickup bed. They have a pickup bed full of fish just in a matter of, in a, not more than an hour, just going out there in the boat and pulling them in. And now, you know, the landscape has just become polluted and the water systems, the water used to be so clear in the Albemarle Sound that you could be on a boat and look all the way to the bottom of the sound. And now it's all cloudy from runoff and it's just not what it was. This captures the essence of it. In fact, for Eastern North Carolina and the Albemarle region, we have the best documents through John Fight and Ralph Lane of what native life was like and what the landscape looked like, how rich the landscape was prior to Europeans coming and having mass agriculture where the runoff goes in and pollutes the, 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 the seed beds for the fish, their spawning grounds, and really decimating the landscape. We take our landscape for granted. We still appreciate it. It's beautiful, but it's not as abundant as it once was prior to uh, colonization and the societies that we've created in modern time. But it's important to understand that the English spread disease. Everywhere the English go, people start to die. Whole villages are wiped out just from interacting with the English, talking to them. Smallpox and all these diseases, they spread and they wipe out whole villages of people in Eastern North Carolina. This only causes the creation of stronger alliances with the Tuscaroras and other Indians in the region because of the loss of life and you need a village, you need a community to be able to survive in this region uh, during this time. So it's very important to understand the English are also defeated. This is a map of the Chesapeake and of Virginia. And if you look uh, to your, what would be your left, you'll see Monagox very clearly marked here with your Tuscaroras, but then you see your Monacans and you see your Powhatans and your other uh, Indians in the Chesapeake area of Virginia. Um, but the Tuscarora would not allow the English to penetrate any further uh, based on the things that they saw happening uh, in the coastal regions. They attacked the um, English when they sailed up the Roanoke River to what is Moratuck today, what is Indian Woods uh, today. That's where I'm from. My people are from Indian Woods and we're you know, of a mixed heritage, but from Indian Woods, they attacked the English and drove the English back to Roanoke Island. They would not allow them to penetrate any further. And the Tuscaroras have always said they have an oral tradition that not only did they, uh, of course, prevent them, that's documented by John White, they were attacked, uh, but they say that they were the ones who went to the lost colony and they destroyed the lost colony because they didn't want these outsiders in. And if you understand military tactics, I always point out to people, if you understand military tactics, if somebody probes you, which is what the English were doing, they were probing. They'd already made contact with all these other villages and mapped them in uh, the Albemarle region and in Southeast North Carolina. And they would spread disease and the people were being killed and dying from disease. And then they had conflicts where they try to take the food of their allies uh, down in the region and they cut the head of one of the chiefs off. So they weren't making a very good you know, impression with native people in Eastern North Carolina. 
And so one of the things that you understand when you are probed, if you have a military patrol that probes you, probes your position, anyone who has any kind of understanding of military tactics, you know, you don't let those people go. You pursue them. And if possible, you destroy them. And the Tuscaroras have always been clear that they were the ones who went to the lost colony. I know it's still being discussed and debated, but they're the ones who went to the lost colony and they're the ones who destroyed the colony because they didn't want that settlement to succeed. And they brought some of those women and children back with them to Berkeley County. And we are talking about the lost colony excavations in Berkeley County today up near Salmon Creek. Um, and they're finding all kinds of artifacts that's tending to support that they were brought back to the Berkeley County area. So I'm gonna wind this down, but what I want you to shoot, all these images that I've inserted, they come from either the Philosophical Society, this image comes from the American Museum in Britain. I did a, a presentation, uh, there was a conference that was sponsored by Oxford University on cartography and the impact of mapping on the colonial world. And they gave me this beautiful map from 1597. The world was well documented. And I think I've shared enough beautiful maps with you for you to understand that there was very little that the Europeans didn't know that they didn't share that information with each other, but they had a great deal of information. You have to go to both groups and understand something about Spanish, French, and the English and look at their cartography to understand more about um, where these people are. But when you overlap all of this literature and this material, it paints a clearer picture of what was taking place in uh, the Albemarle region and in North Carolina and Virginia during this particular time period. But this is just a very beautiful map. And if you look closely at the map, you see the Albemarle Sound, you see the Chihuahuan River and the villages along the Chihuahuan River, and you see the Roanoke River, and you see the villages along the Roanoke River. I'm very proud to say that with Indian Woods, which is where all my family is from, my mother and father's people are from, we have the oldest consistently recorded in maps and in the colonial record of any community in North Carolina, just simply the oldest, consistent. And then when they established Indian Woods in 1717, it was the first native reservation established in the United, what became the United States. So we have this constant rich history that we all took for granted because everybody was kin. We know where everybody's buried. We just kind of took it for granted. But we have this rich history in Bertie County and in Indian Woods that many other communities in the United States, even coastal communities in Virginia or Maryland just do not have. And it's something that we should all be proud of. Um, so I'm gonna, Pause, stop here. The last thing I wanna mention as I stop for some questions, because I know I've gone over, is I do want to also understand the merging of culture and the bringing in of African people, because I think very few people realize that the first Africans, first Africans were brought by the Spanish as early as the 1500s, right? I mean, Jacksonville, Florida was a, a, a Spanish fort, in, uh, fort that was manned by all African soldiers in Jacksonville, Florida. So it's just important to understand that there have always been Africans in the Americas. And there also were Africans in North Carolina that were brought by the English, particularly Sir Francis Drake, who released over 600 Africans in the area. Um, I pointed out to you the devastation, I pointed out to you um, disease. When the English are forced out of the region, the region is not what it was. The Indians have been really decimated. Then you bring in the African populations and many of the Africans have been exposed to European diseases and tended to be resistant to it. And they begin to intermix with the local Indian populations. And you'll begin to see by the six, late 1600s, early 1700s, nations of Indians that did not exist when John White first mapped the region. You see you're now the Machapunga Indians, which are black Indians. You see the Bear River Indians. You see the Man of Mesquite Indians you see a number of different groups of Indians that are mixed with African-American uh, or Africans that did not exist prior to the English arriving and mapping the region. And that is because these Africans who are released in the region armed with guns basically will end up creating maroon societies, maroon communities, and intermarrying with the local Algonquin Indians, creating and reconstituting themselves as something other than what they were. So I'm gonna stop here. This is a good stopping point because we're already over time. And if, if, if there is any time for questions, I will take any questions. Mr. Collins? Okay. 
what I, what I have is a paper by one of my PhD students at University of Memphis who kind of looks at this material um, from uh, the Spanish and their interactions with Africans. And I have some sources that I can share with you. So if you send me an email, I can share with you the sources. Now, some of this is still is going to be what we know happened because there's a, a matter of fact, I have it in here. I'll show you that map. Uh, we know that this happened because this map illustrates this is in at Brown University, the original map is at Brown University. Uh, this map shows the English fleet coming across the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of North Africa in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and then in the Caribbean. And Drake's fleet, when it goes into the Caribbean, it's attacking Spanish islands and cities and seizing gold and silver and then filling the ships that are part of that fleet with that gold and silver. And then he goes to Florida and then he goes up to North Carolina and basically he tells the Africans that they pick up in the Caribbean that if they will fight for England, he'll give them their freedom. And so many of these people, they take them you know, to uh, Roanoke Island and they release them. So there is no, you're not gonna find a document just like some of this early Indian history, you're not gonna find a document that says what happens to those people. What you have to then look at is the archeological evidence and the descendants, there are many people in Hyde County and throughout um, you know, you know, that region, uh, even down in Pamlico County, but basically in that area who will say that they'd always been there. They're African-Americans, but they look, they look different. They look clearly mixed with something other than just being African. They're not African, they're mixed with something. And they will say to you orally, they've always been in Hyde County. They always have been in Terrell County. They've always been in that region around the Alligator Swamp and the Madame Mesquite Swamp. They've always been there. And, uh, and so you're gonna have to, you know, basically look at these families and these families, these oral traditions and where these people are to kind of get to some of this information because they don't, you're not gonna necessarily, you, you will find that the English came, you're gonna find that they brought these ships, you're gonna find that they knew they were under threat and they took the surviving um, soldiers that were there, they took those men with them back to England. That's all pretty well documented and recorded. But like you said, what actually happened to those people, the speculation had been where well, they just died or they just drowned. And you're correct. There isn't like a smoking gun that says this is what happened to them. But they, if they were released as you expect them to have been, which is what Drake promised them, they were given weapons, which gave them a tactical advantage over the Indians that would have been left in the region. And they were Maroons. When they were picked up in the Caribbean, they were runaway slaves and they were slaves that were on the Spanish islands in the Caribbean. And basically coming to Eastern North Carolina, which is basically a big swamp, you know, uh, Alligator Swamp, Great Dismal Swamp, that whole region was just a big swamp. These people were accustomed to living in the swamps and living in the mountains of, uh, of the Caribbean. And to me, I always point out this like putting ducks in water. I mean, you know, if you took Marines and you dropped them off uh, anywhere in the world, you wouldn't expect them to die. You would expect them to make do. Yes. Yes. That's correct. That's absolutely right. Like I said, a lot of activity that we, as uh, because we start our history with the English and we start with Jamestown, Virginia in 1607 and then the Africans in 1619, that is all not talked about. But you're absolutely right. Weber's uh, book on uh, the Spanish in the North American frontier is an excellent resource to understand you know, all of the places in which the Spanish established colonies, even up toward Warren Wilson College, I, I believe it was uh, Jehora, uh, the fort, they've already excavated that Spanish fort up in that region uh, uh, in North Carolina. So yes, there, there is a great deal of information uh, that has been overlooked by our scholars because you know, they, we didn't look at Spanish records, we didn't look at the French records, we only looked at the English records. When the And again, that's absolutely correct as well. I, I, I didn't touch on that because I'm trying to not, I'm trying to, I, I won't say spoon feed people, but I'm trying to 
just give them the basics so that they kind of understand and start reorienting their thinking. But you're absolutely right. And the, the piece that my PhD student has written, we, he's written an ar uh, article, it, well, it was a chapter of his dissertation about maroonage and talks about this and the fact that, yes, this young man, uh, they, they kidnapped, because they had been raiding the North Carolina coast for Indian slaves for a long time. And they had taken a Powhatan Indian back uh, down to Mexico City and educated him uh, and taught him uh, uh, the Spanish language. And then they brought him back to the Chesapeake to install him or installed him as the leader of the Powhatan. And again, he had to make a choice, right? He had to, when, when they, he saw the priests were degrading him in front of his, uh, his people, in front of the other Powhatan. And they were looking at him. He was about, to be, he would have been killed by them if he had not ordered them or said, told them, yes, go ahead and kill these priests and destroy this church because it was contrary to their tradition. I mean, they believed in polygamy and you know, the king was supposed to have multiple wives and many of the men had multiple wives. The, the church frowned on that and didn't want him to have multiple wives. The church would all, all kinds of things, but there was a clear cultural clash between the Spanish and the Catholic faith and the natives and their faith. And yes, that's what led to their destruction, to the destruction of them. And he had a choice to make and he chose to side with his people and destroy the Spanish. Yes, yes, Ms. Scott. I'm going to say something. Let me start off by saying I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation today. But uh, prior to the English arriving and even when the English arrived, I read Roots a long time ago out by Alex Hill. And they had a person who kept history. All that time. Do mm -hmm. so you think that same thing occurred here where the English, where the Indians kept some type of history orally, or uh, even after the uh, English settled, did they use mention the belts right. as part of it? But mm -hmm. uh, do you think they had someone who orally kept records of that? Well, well, the short answer is yes, but the longer answer is is, is this. I point out to people um, about disease and how it impacted Native people. Um, you got a computer and you have all your work, your, your life's work, in my case, my life's work on my computer. And then the computer drive gets corrupted and I lose all that work. You know, I lose that work. I can reconstruct some of that, but most of it is lost. And if I didn't keep hard copies of it, paper copies of it, it's gonna be hard. Um, that's what disease did to native people. They were primarily an oral people, but they had very keen minds and they passed on uh, their traditions, uh, gathering plants, you know, for medicinal purposes, alliances and so forth. They passed them on orally and using these wampum belts, but you have to be able to read the wampum belts and disease kills the very old and the very young. We just seen it. We just saw it happen here with, with COVID. I mean, it's killing the very old you know, the oldest among us, people over 65 and anybody who has any other kind of ailment. And uh, fortunately for us, it wasn't killing the very young. But these diseases that were brought by the Europeans, they killed the very young, uh, rubella, mumps, measles, smallpox, chickenpox, and they killed the very old. And so when you lose the older people, um, you're going to lose a lot of your history and your culture. In any family, you know, if your grandmother dies and she hasn't shared, finished sharing everything with the younger people or with you before she dies or your parents, it's lost. So uh, yes, you have many groups of people who still remember their history and their heritage and they passed those traditions on, but they became isolated. They became separated and they lost an understanding of how they were connected. And it, it just me and the journey that I took going to Canada, going to New York, talking to Tuscaroras in New York and Canada and Oklahoma and around Eastern North Carolina, talking to different factions of people who say they, they're related to Tuscaroras. I was able to reconstruct using the maps and using the history. I was able to reconstruct what I have shown you all today, right? But prior to me doing that and going and visiting with all these communities and seeing that there are names that are the same, seeing that the things that they do, how they're eating certain foods is the same, you have to have traveled around and interacted with the different groups of people to understand that there is more, they have more in common than they have that separates them. But to, to, a long answer to your question that yes, they have kept things, but they tended to keep it isolated. Like if you have a group in Maxton, you know, that are Locklears that are, that, or Locklears, Lowry's, Oxidines, you have groups of people, they said, well, we are always been Tuscarora, but they didn't know anything about Indian Woods because they don't know this area up here much and they don't know things about other places. So in that way, what part of what this work does do is it brings everybody under the same understanding. This is how the world existed. This is what happened. 
And then you can take those different community stories and have a fuller and richer understanding of what took place. We're trying to reconstruct the hard drive. Thank you for your questions and comments, sir. Well, we would like to thank everyone coming out today. We would like to thank our guests who have joined us virtually. We like to thank our in-person guests, but we would like to really thank Dr. Smallwood for coming all the way from North Carolina A&T today. And just, I think Berkey County has an individual that they should be very proud of that's sharing the history of the Albemarle region. And again, we thank you very much. Thank you.